Jeff's coping very well with the heat, but then again, so am I. But the key difference between me and him, <laughs> yeah, talking about you, lad, is that I have to drink about a litre of water every hour, whereas Jeff, despite his complaining, doesn't have to drink anything for the next seven days despite this heat. They don't store water. He hasn't got water in that hump. That's purely a fat reserve. He's got a little bit in his guts, but the key thing that he does is that he doesn't lose what he's got. He uses his long limbs and his long neck as radiators to get rid of heat without losing water. He hardly sweats at all. He sucks every drop of moisture out of his food and he allows his core body temperature to rise up to six degrees higher than normal, which would kill a human. It's all very well for camels to set off without water, but we're going too, and that means we have to take a vast quantity of water with us. It really will make the difference between us surviving this trip or not. So expedition doctor Mukul is determined to make sure we all get the message. Sifa's our guide. He's going to tell us what we've got on uh, today. For the next days, we'll be walking on the salt caravan route. This route is always really difficult. There are many people who die from the weather, I mean, from the heat. This is serious stuff. Just from the car yesterday, a lot of us weren't as good with the water as we could have been. I certainly had a dehydration headache, and I know several others did. We've got to be better here, otherwise this will kill us. We're in the middle of absolutely nowhere, and it's going to get worse. So and the good news? Yeah. <laughs> This is one of the great trade routes of the ancient world. Over the centuries, thousands will have set off from here, and I feel a real sense of privilege to be one of the few Westerners to get the chance to join them. This part of Ethiopia can also be a dangerous place for outsiders. Just last year, a group of British tourists were kidnapped only a few kilometers from where we're walking. These high-sided canyons make perfect ambush territory for local bandits. So it's comforting to have Afar local militia to look after us, with the standard must-have accessory, the AK-47. But while we keep moving quickly and rather nervously through the canyons, geologist Dougal can't resist taking his time to get a proper look at the rocks. We've now entered this world which I'm really, really excited about because we're going down canyons where either side of the canyons I've got just geology, just geology exposed 100%. Whatever the dangers and the hardships, for Dougal, this is what the trip is all about. Either side of the valley we've got these fantastic sedimentary rocks. And these rocks are sediments that were deposited in marine setting, so they would have essentially been horizontal as they were deposited, and you get series of rocks over thousands, even millions of years deposited through time. But what we're seeing here is these rocks are now tilted. They've been tilted along massive cracks in the Earth's crust, which are essentially acting as big fault zones, and these things are tilting in, and that's something very, very important in this region. And Dougal finds evidence that as the land here sinks, it's bringing us closer to the volcanic layer beneath the Earth's crust. Here we have a crack in the Earth's crust, and here you can see a brown rock is coming up through that crack. Now, this brown rock was molten rock before, magma, which is lava when it erupts at the surface and feeds volcanoes. And what we're seeing here is like a freeze-framed plumbing system of a volcano. As our second day draws to a close, in the heat, it feels like we've covered a huge distance, whereas we've only done 18 kilometers, well short of our target.
day three and our first serious test begins. A 30 kilometer hike to the next campsite. And to add to the unrelenting sun and lack of water, we have a new element to overcome. The Gara, the wind of fire, which powers down from the baking sands of Arabia, turning this part of the desert into a vast, superheated wind tunnel. Today, we've got a really hard day because not only have we got to face the fire wind, um, which apparently is sort of similar to standing in front of a fan-assisted oven with it on full blast all day, um, but we've also got to make up all the time that we didn't do yesterday. So we've probably got 10 or 12 hours walking today. If we can keep up an average speed of three kilometers per hour, we should reach camp before nightfall. Any one of us could manage that speed in normal conditions, but these conditions are far from normal. By early afternoon, the temperature has hit 46 degrees. Despite our best efforts, all the elements nature has thrown against us have slowed us more than we thought. As the sun goes down, we still have several kilometers to go, so we have no choice but to keep walking into the night to reach our overnight stop. Well, we're walking through what can only be described as, uh, as a sort of human-sized hairdryer, and this is um, the fire wind that we've all been talking about, but obviously it's at night time, so it's a bit cooler. Um, and the reason why we haven't just stopped to camp is because uh, this area is uh, a little bit unsafe. There's no shelter, um, there's no water provisions, and also there's uh, some rebels in the area. All we can do is hope our guides know where they're going as we play follow my leader in the wind-blown dark. Until we finally make it to camp. Oh, got all the grit my face. Right, we're here. A full 15 hours after setting off. I'm just really, really glad I phoned ahead for the penthouse suite. I'm going to look forward to that tonight, I tell you. You know, all I can feel is this wind and I have a sense of the fact that this place is a wide open space. Tomorrow when the sun comes up, I think we'll get a, a better idea of what we've got left. We wake up in a place called Hamadella. Officially, it's a village. In fact, it's little more than a bleak military outpost just 15 kilometers from the border with neighboring Eritrea. After a decade of open warfare, they're now enjoying a period of peace. But no one's quite sure how long the fragile truce will last. That's the border with Eritrea. Um, so this is a very hot political area. <clears throat> there are police and army basically stationed here at all times. We were told very categorically, when you want to go for a wee in the night, don't go that way, because you'll be shot. We're now just two hours' walk from our first destination, the salt mine.